Hello, my name is Rebecca Haas, and I'm the Director of Community Engagement for Pacific Opera Victoria. Welcome to Behind the Scenes, Lifting the Curtain. This is a project that we were invited to participate in by the Greater Victoria Public Library. And I'm delighted that in this video, I'm going to be able to take you to the prop shop for Pacific Opera, where you'll meet our head of props, Maureen, and learn about how all those things are made and the roles those objects play in all the stories we tell on stage. And you're gonna get a chance to peek behind the curtain, quite literally, backstage at the Royal Theatre with head carpenter, Tom Heemskirk. So enjoy your video tour and discover all of the magic that happens that makes the opera look so easy on stage. There are so many people involved in these projects. I hope you enjoy your virtual tour. My name is Maureen McIntosh. I'm the head props person for Pacific Opera and have been for 30 years. And a prop is basically um, anything that an actor holds in his hands or touches at any point. But because we're a small company, a lot of my job is doing set stuff. So if there's a tree that has to be made, I have to make it. If there's a sculpture that has to be sculpted, I do it. Any kind of um, greenery or anything like that, uh, we do it. So it's a little bit of a crossover of um, between the scenics and props and also between wardrobe as well, because there's often sculptural type pieces that need to be made by wardrobe or masks that we make. That's what we end up doing in the props department. Um, and I wanted to show you some of the things that we have to do um, and also some of the materials that we use a lot. This is the material that's called Warbler and it's uh, thermoplastics that you melt with um, or soften with a heat gun and we make so much stuff with it. This is uh, foot lights that needed to be done. So I carved the original one and then we had to mass produce. We had to make about 30 of these. And so with the warbler, we just um, put it over top. It dries in about, oh, I don't know, maybe five minutes so you can lift it off. So it's a very fast production that you can do. Um, we had to make an awful lot of rifles and we can't afford to go and buy rifles. So we bought one that gave us our base and then we um, just warbled all the pieces so that we could have rifles that look pretty darn good. They look pretty light. They are. They're very light. Like in comparison to a real gun, they're very light and very durable. Like they're very strong, which is fantastic. You know, we make uh, all the um, dagger holders out of war bloods because so that they fit each individual knife. Um, I'm beginning to think that opera is very violent. <laughs> I've got guns well, and I have knives. A little bit. Yes, <laughs> well, they're, they're yes, dramatic stories yes, we're telling. we dramatic stories. And because we're the opera, it's quite nice is because we usually do things in a certain time period. So we don't have to, like, we almost always know there's going to be food in an opera, we almost always know there's gonna be some kind of weapons. We almost always know that the furniture is going to be uh, very fancy. Oh, yes, yeah. show us some fancy furniture. So this is a piece, this is a piece that um, we had to do for some opera, and I, sorry, I can only tell you who the designer was for, it was Pam Johnson, I can't tell you which, uh, um, so we needed to make these fancy chairs and we had these chairs already. And then I just went and bought some mirrors that um, I cut up and attached to the backs of the chairs. So we would have this kind of look that um, we always have. And as I said, we always have food in every opera. So here's a basket of food. This is getting ready for Carmen because um, that the scene where all the vendors and everybody are. So we have lots of um, trays of food and, and oranges and stuff like that. And this is a piece that 
has um, often been used in the crowd scenes for um, uh, sorry, somebody to be carrying. And again, the boys, the carpenters just built me the box. And then we collect doodads constantly. Anytime we see doodads, we just buy them because we know we're going to use them. So we put these on. And this crank is off of my meat grinder. So <laughs> nothing <laughs> sacred in my house. And uh, yeah, so that's the little organ grinder. And um, this one came off of, um, it was a Vim show. Uh, I've brought... I want to say that no, that was a Glen Islation show um, mm -hmm. that had all the fish in the back for the yes. for the bidding. Right. Um, oh, Rake's Progress is what I was thinking about. Rake's it Progress. Had fish, but that's oh, not those it fish. is Rake's Progress. It is Rake's Progress. It is Rake's okay. Progress. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. so that was an Alan uh, Stitchberry design. Yes, that's right. So these were just carved out of styrofoam, and then we put um, the gold foil on top of it and a resin on top of that because we had to make a lot of these. So that was uh, another piece that we've done. And these ones are from a Kami Koo uh, and a Glynis directed play. I don't know what it's called. We had to make over a hundred of these heads and they were all over the set. The bookshelf was just filled with all of these heads. And so what these are is we just bought the styrofoam heads. We had about three different styles. And then we just took tissue paper and just sculpted around and added pieces on and off um, to uh, just give them different characters. And then they were just painted white. And the rest of that set was all fake books okay. that were hours and hours. So it was, um, we just took the corrugated paper and um, put it so it looked like the end things and cardboard and glued them all together. And we went through probably about six boxes of glue sticks, great big huge <laughs> glue sticks. <laughs> and I think there was five of us doing nothing but making these books. The set was so huge with all of these books. Would you like to pick it up and show people how light it is? Because it's surprising. Maybe. <laughs> Yes, just styrofoam. Yes. So easy, so easy and light. They're all, you know, that's one of the things that you have to kind of stay on top of it. If you can't give a act, an actor something that's heavy, something that they can't manipulate properly, it has to be light. It has to be comfortable for them to be able to, um, to work with it. So, yeah. What's been your favorite prop to make. Before the internet, you could order things and you really had to sort of create something out of nothing. What sticks out in your memory? Mm, I have so many that I loved to make. Um, that's, that's always been the, my most fun. I would have to say in the last little bit, the, the uh, most wonderful show that we worked on was Hansel and Gretel that we got to do for a Vancouver opera. And it was all wonderful masks and puppets and things like that. And that's my most fun. And this one is going to be really fun working on Alice in Wonderland because it's all made props. Like we have to make everything, you know, like the flamingo croquet set and the hedgehog balls. And yeah, so it's going to be really fun. What so would surprise people the most to learn about what your job is? What do you think is most surprising about your work? Well, I think that the most surprising would be, you know, is that um, if if they saw, I have a, I didn't bring it out, but I have a sample of a hookah pipe, you know, it's from Rake's Progress as well, that, you know, it's about this tall, and it looks like we probably bought it, but we didn't, we just went to a garden store and bought pots and stuck it together, so we had the shape that we needed and, and everything, and and I think that that's, I think that also people don't realize how much time goes into making things. Like it's a very, you know, we because we only have six weeks to build a show, we do have to move quite fast and stuff, but um, we're pretty good at moving pretty fast these days. And I would have to say my least favorite thing in the whole wide world is blood. 
<laughs> so tell us a little bit about blood. There's a lot of blood in opera. We've seen a lot of weapons, uh, so we know there's yes, a lot of blood. There's a lot of blood. It's just so hard to get it out of clothes, not to get it all over everything. It's it's really a pain to have to work with blood and to make it look really good. You know, I mean, nowadays it's much easier, like in the days when we used to have to make up our own blood and we did it with, you know, soap or if there was a cornstarch recipe and there was a soap recipe. It was really hard. And also because the other thing that happens is that we don't know what the lights are going to be until we're on the stage. And sometimes those lights, like they use a lot of blue light, which means that you can't have a certain shade of blood because it would, it would just look horrible, right? So that's one of the things that we do have. I mean, I remember once carving the absolute most beautiful set for Shirley Valentine. And it was all stone wall and rocks and stuff like that. And uh, the lighting person killed it. Like it was so flat, you could not see all the carving that he had done. And it was, you know, it's one of those things that that's sometimes what happens. And it's this makes me think about something I know everyone worked very hard on here, which was Fidelio. Mm -hmm. And you spent months gathering shoes yes. from all the different sort of value village thrift stores. Uvic. Thank God for Uvic. Uvic was basically where we got all of our... Uh, shoes for that but there was I think there was over 10,000 shoes in that show 10,000 because in the director's mind the concept mm -hmm. of the story being that we have someone who is basically a prisoner right. and it was really relating to the idea of refugees in other places where mm -hmm. people have been held prisoner yeah. nameless faceless and so all of these shoes if I remember correctly were all built into the floor of the stage as well as that's the right. front that's right so there was it was it was actually twofold is that we had them all across the front and then we had them all in, um, in on the actual surface of the deck. And it, we had tissue paper as well. So he wanted it to look like it was mud. So it was years and layers of people who had been buried there. And, and, and then we had these giant crates, you know, that were like this, that were completely filled with shoes. And there was at least, I don't know, I think there was eight of them that we had to fill. So it was a lot, a lot of shoes. And we had to cut all the shoes in half because of, they had to lie flat. And of course, most shoes have a shank in the middle of them. So we had to get those out. And it turned out that the best way to actually cut them in half, because we tried to run it through the bandsaw, but that rubber just heated up and grabbed the blade. So I had just had my ax sharpened. We put it in the vice grip. <laughs> And we just ran the shoes through the, the ice. But that's the problem solving, you know. It's like you go, okay, we can't use the bandsaw, so how can we cut these in half that will be fast, efficient, and uh, work for us? And the axe was the, the solution. Uh, I really want to thank you, Maureen, for taking the time to show us some really interesting props and share some of your immense wealth of knowledge. Uh, I would love at some point to see all the fun things you have around your house and how you've deployed props in a meaningful way in your life because uh, they're really incredible artistic creations. And I'm so grateful that you had some time for us today to show us some of the cool things here in the uh, prop shop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Today, I'm lucky to have with me Tom Heemskirk as my guide. Tom is the head carpenter at the Royal Theatre and has been since 1990, and he's going to guide us around the backstage and give us all a glimpse of something that normally an audience never gets to see. Tom has seen many shows go through the Royal Theatre. He's there for all the touring shows, as well as one-night shows from local performers and the opera. The first place that Tom takes me is off stage left, and down the stairs to the backstage underneath the stage. Down here we find the dressing rooms. There are dressing rooms for the conductor and also for all the performers. The first room we go into is the conductor's suite. It's very fancy. It's also closest to the stage for easy access for the conductor. You'll notice that it's decorated almost like it's a set in the opera. It's quite fancy. I thought it was funny that this is the most beautiful dressing room of all, especially since the conductor is the one who probably spends the least amount of time 
of anyone in their dressing room because they're always in the orchestra pit conducting for the whole night. The other dressing rooms are varying sizes, and there'll be anything from one person to four or five people in a dressing room, depending on what the cast size is. I can tell you that in my many years as a professional singer, that dressing rooms are actually very fun places during a show. And while this one is empty right now and nothing is on any of the surfaces, normally there are flowers in here, which are gifted on opening night. We also give each other cards on opening night, so there'll usually be all kinds of beautiful cards and letters and notes wishing you well. For singers, there'll be boxes of tea for sore throats. Next is the green room. You'll notice it's not green, but that's the official name of this room where the cast and orchestra hang out during the show if they're not in their dressing room, and the place where visitors often wait to see someone after the show. Now, curiously, when I did some research, there's very little historical evidence that these were ever painted green, but there are many stories about where the name comes from. So one of the stories is that these rooms at one time were painted green because the glare of the stage lights were so hard on people's eyes that the green was an antidote? I doubt that one is true. Some people also think it's a corruption of the term scene room, back from a time when not only was this room a place where the actors would wait to go on stage, but it would also store extra scenery. If you're someone, though, who suffers from stage fright and looked at those earlier scenes of the Royal and thought you would never want to stand on that stage, there is a story that the room is called a green room because it's a place where people turn green from nerves before they go on stage. <laughs> Whatever the truth is, the term is still used today, even though these rooms aren't green. Now, this space will look generous to you because it's empty. But imagine if it's 30 minutes before curtain, before the show starts, the tables you see are covered with instrument cases, and the orchestra is all sitting here, and that can be up to 20 to 30 players. And then imagine there's a chorus in this show. Well, that's another 20 people plus lounging around here, chatting, talking. The singers with roles, the cast, they have dressing rooms, but they will often come and mingle in this room as well. That's another 5 to 10 people. And now imagine that the mirrors here, this is a makeup station or wig station. And that means there's people lined up to have their makeup done in order of when they go on stage or have their wig put on. It is a very busy place when we're in full performance here at the Royal. Now we go to the chorus rooms. They make up all the crowd scenes in opera, so they need a very large room. While being a performer is a job, it's also a family experience. For many of the performers, They've come from somewhere else. The leads in the operas come from all over the world. And so we make a little family when we're together in a show. We spend four to six weeks together in a city preparing the opera, usually four weeks of rehearsal and then one to two weeks of performances. So we become quite close and you can really see that there's a very community neighborhood feel to the backstage area that allows us all to hang out together as friends. I want to give my thanks today to Tom Heemskirk for the tour of the Royal Theatre. I hope you all enjoyed the stories and insights into the world of professional theatre, and I look forward to seeing you all in the theatre in the future. I'm Rebecca Haas for Pacific Opera Victoria. Thanks for joining me.